to have you here and I think everyone joining as well. Um, so I just want to start by maybe saying hi to everyone and uh, saying a few words about now for those who don't know us yet. So we are the global movement uh, working to push people across the globe to work as one and uh, to find solution to our world's biggest issues. Uh, so we created what we call those digital town halls, uh, which is which are basically online talks um, that we we have to discuss with experts, uh, politicians, citizens, activists, and basically everyone who's interested in key aspects of uh, global issues such as uh, the climate change. Because we're actually uh, doing this event uh, in the context of of our climate campaign. So we have a uh, campaign we, where we're demanding that UN leaders uh, declare global climate emergencies and uh, to push for concrete uh, climate actions. So as you know, we are joined by uh, Vanessa. And so for those who don't know it, uh, who don't know her yet, Vanessa is this incredible climate uh, justice from Uganda. Uh, and she has such an inspiring journey uh, since, since the end of 2019. Uh, 18, sorry, she has been striking against uh, climate inaction in her home country. And she's also the founder of two African um, based climate movements, which are uh, Youth for Future Africa, which aims to, to make new African urban and rural infrastructures uh, and investments plans more climate resilience. And the second one uh, is the Rise Up movement. So this is um, a movement basically uh, which which aims to make uh, the voices of those fighting for the climate on the African continent uh, heard and to ensure that they are not left out of important climate actions but also uh, climate discussions. So it's really not an exaggeration to say that Vanessa has given uh, a voice really to African uh, climate activists. So Vanessa, could you tell us more about your story and how did you become an activist? I'm sure we all want to hear more about that from you. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. I'm always very thankful for these opportunities because they give me a chance to be able to talk about climate activism, not just what I do, but what the rest of the people are doing. And I really appreciate it. I don't take it for granted. So my name is Vanessa Nakate, and I'm a climate activist from Uganda. Um, becoming a climate activist uh, was a process for me. I, it's not like I grew up understanding nature or the environment. I didn't really know much about it. And I didn't even know the connection that, you know, humanity has with nature. I didn't understand all that through my childhood, through my high school. I never got to see, you know, the reason why nature is important. But I must say, I love the presence of trees. I loved having to sit under a tree, especially in primary school, um, during the break sessions out of class, and maybe you're having your breakfast and then you sit under a tree. I really loved those moments. And at some point, I never really thought I would uh, do something connected to climate activism. And uh, when I look at my names, some, sometimes someone asked me what my names mean. So Nakate is more like an animal because in my, in my culture, they, they call people after plants, after animals, after trees. So my name Nakate represents cows. So and my other name, apart from Vanessa, is Florence. And when you cut Florence short, it is Flora, and it also represents nature. So I tried to combine the two, and I'm like, maybe I was really meant to be an activist, based on the names I ended up getting. So um, in 2018, I really wanted to do something that could cause change in the lives of the people in my community and uh, in my country, but I really didn't know what exactly I would do because there are quite a number of problems in the world and it is really hard to find that one problem that you can uh, relate with that you can you know find solutions for because people are suffering from different parts of the world 
So I carried out research to find out um, the problems people face. And I found the usual ones that we've heard about, like corruption, unemployment, teenage pregnancies, um, uh, inequalities among gender and all that stuff. So I was really surprised of all the problems I got to find that climate change was one of those problems. And I personally felt like that's something I would, you know, relate with. And that's something I can try to, you know, talk about and create awareness for. But as a young person, of course, I didn't have any resources. I didn't have any, I just had a phone, literally. I didn't have much that I would do. So I decided to read more about climate change to understand it. Because in schools, these teachers, our teachers uh, teach us these things, they educate us, but they never really tell us that it's reality and it's happening right now. It's more like uh, climate change already happened in the past or it's coming in the far future and Vanessa, you don't have to worry about it. Just live your life, enjoy your childhood, grow up and probably get married. So that that's more like how education was, you know? But then when I got to find out that climate change is real and climate change is here and getting to know its causes, um, the impacts, the impacts really, you know, hurt me the most because when I saw those impacts, I realized that there are actually people in my country who are already suffering those things. For example, in the Mount Elgon area, we have people who are suffering with landslides and flooding and um torrential rainfall and these people i've seen them on the news cry out to the government for help and we last see them at the moment when the disaster happens we never know if they get any help we never know if someone comes to rescue them because they lose their families you know they lose their children they lose their farms they lose their houses people are left homeless when these disasters happen and finding out that many of them cannot find help when it comes to these things. In my country, it's not like um, a, a very developed country. It's more like a developing country. And most of the people, their survival is on agriculture and subsistence farming. So when you look at all the things that climate change brings about, the intensity of droughts, the wildfires, the floods, and everything you realize how much it's causing a risk for the you know for the availability of food it is threatening availability of food for these people and their livelihoods because most of them depend on subsistence farming for survival when you look at their children some children have to walk long distances so when a flood happens they cannot cross over rivers in order to go to school they have to walk long distances to collect water just in case of a water stress as a result of the intense droughts so getting to understand and relate with all these impacts of climate change and seeing that they are here right now i decided to read about um, how to bring awareness of a problem to people and i read about uh, some of the past movements and uh, I saw that the black people were so much into uh, movements in the past and it was really motivating for me. And uh, that's how I also found out about the Fridays for Future movement. I read about it and I saw uh, the work that they were doing and I thought it's something that I would maybe do because I would just need um, to go to the street, have a phone to share my work and create awareness with that. But then naturally, Actually, I grew up as a very shy person. And by the way, if you're to meet me in person, I'm really shy. I, I don't know how to look at someone like straight in the face. So it took me time to actually decide to go out there on the streets and demand for action. So I first avoided it for some months until sometime like it came back. I just don't know how, but it just came back and it hit me again. And I just knew I had to do something. I just knew I had to start climate activism, whether I was you know, comfortable with it or not. And I was also in a single sex school for only girls. And it was, We've, we were taught to, you know, have dignity and respect and it's really contradicting for a girl to just go on the street holding placards because of, you know, how people may perceive you and the messages they may throw at you. So I had all those challenges coming along, but then I just decided to overcome all that and decide to do what I thought was, you know, the best thing to do. 
and I, I must say I've been striking for over a year, over a year now every Friday and then I, I also started a campaign to save the Congo rainforest. The Congo rainforest is the largest rainforest in uh, Africa and uh, it's, it's, it's hab it harbors millions of species of animals and plants and millions of people heavily depend on its existence. So I thought that it was important that we protect this forest. This is because I was seeing so much of the news talk about uh, other forests like the Amazon and I felt like the forests in Africa were being left out and yet they were also under destruction. So I started doing this track every day and uh, right now it has quite a number of people. I'm so certain if you are on Twitter and maybe you follow me, you must be seeing the retweets I usually make of the number of people that are doing the Save Congo Rainforest Strike. And um, along with my activism, I started a project to help install solar and institutional stoves in schools. Uh, to make them accessible. You know, we say that uh, we need to make sustainable paths to development, we need to transition and change certain things. And one of those things is adopting renewable energy in our lives. But the thing is, not every, co not every person, not every community is able to afford that renewable energy. In some countries, it is really expensive. So with this project, we get, um, we get solar. I'm always helped by some of some climate activists. Um, I get solar and uh, it is installed in a school and also institutional stores. These stores, first of all, they ensure clean cooking for the students, uh, for the chefs who prepare the food at school. And also they are good for the environment. How? Because with this stove, if a school was using five trucks of firewood at time, with this stove they would end up using like only two trucks at time, hence reducing on the levels of deforestation that are going on and reducing on the trees that are being cut down and just ensure that they can use what is enough. So this project is uh, something that has been running and so far I've done the installation in two schools. But this project is fully financed and monitored by the internet. That is how I'm able to get the funds for this project. And it was just put on a stove because of the situation that we are in right now. But I believe by now we would be covering the fourth school. And uh, what else? A, <laughs> Basically, that's me. Yeah, you have such an amazing <laughs> story. And it's so great to see that you were yourself inspired by youth movement like Friday for, future, for, for the Future. And now you become in yourself a whole um, empowering you know, symbol and, and, uh, and public figure. And I think what one point that you mentioned is like, the, the need for more awareness. I think that's like a global issue when it comes to climate, um, the climate crisis globally. But we rarely get the chance to hear from, you know, African climate activists. And that's why it's so important the work that you do that, you know, really makes that central. And I'd like to know if you could share with us actually, what is it, how is it to be um, doing climate activism? on the African continent and more specifically uh, in Uganda? What has been your experience? Um, thank you for that question. Uh, doing climate activism hasn't been a very smooth journey for me, especially uh, in all ways actually, because I come from a country where people have urgent basic needs that they need to address. People need to get water to drink, people need to get food to eat, People need to get housing and rent and all that stuff. So, and the unemployment rates are high for the young people who leave school and graduate. So it has been a challenge trying to educate these people about the issue of climate change and convincing them to join the climate movement because they always have an issue of, um, we have more things to take care of. We have worse problems to take care of. So it's very hard to convince a person who has urgent basic needs, whose life is not comfortable, to try and join a climate movement, and yet they have better things to do. And uh, when it comes to the schools, um, 
it is hard because the weather schools are built in uh, my country. I don't know if it's the same with, but I think it's the same with almost every African country. Uh, the schools, the schools are fenced. Um, they have Ascari security personnel. So it is really hard to make students walk out of school on Friday to join you for the climate activism. And um, if they did that, they'll be subjected to suspension and expulsion. So that one has also been a challenge. And then um, there's also an issue of what I say, people, people having basic, basic needs. So they ask you, if I join the movement, what do I gain? And literally there is nothing you're going to tell them that uh, you're going to maybe get some money or some property, something like that. People always expect something in return. So it is hard to have them, you know, join you when they, when, when they find out that there is, no, there is nothing to gain from it, you're just trying to save the planet and secure a better future for everyone. And then it is also hard to get permits, especially as an activist. Most African countries are so political and everything is taken so politically. So it is really hard to give permits for weekly strikes. Personally, I've never got a permit for a climate strike. Uh, for the time I've been in activism, for the time I've done activism with my friends as well, it's more like it's more of a risk-taking decision to go out on the street with the hope of not being arrested. So it has been quite of a very complicated journey, but I must say that sometimes when you face your fears that is when you're able to overcome them so whatever the challenges are we keep moving and we keep speaking and we keep pushing the message that's great and like you said you started with just a phone and i know it's, it must be complicated in this context that makes it hard to 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 come up with collective action and to push for to fight for the climate but can you tell us what if there's like a good practice in particular that you found that works um, in making people aware of the urgency of the climate, um, climate crisis? Um, the best way uh, that I've got to tell people about the climate crisis in person, yeah, there have yeah. been two activities. One of them is going to schools, going to schools and requesting the principals to give you a time to talk to the students, maybe at an assembly and get to, you know, teach them and tell them about climate change and let them know, let them understand that they can pass on this message to their parents or to their siblings so that something can be done so that we, we make a collective effort to demand for action, even with the small people that we reach. The other thing is, We've had uh, cleaning activities where we go to uh, local communities and clean their, clean their surroundings for them because this gives us an opportunity to talk to them directly about the dangers of polluting, about the dangers of climate change, and they get to understand that if, they, if the rainfall uh, does not come when it's expected to come, and if it is to come, it is so intense in form of torrential rainfall, then that is climate change. We get to teach them through that. Then the other way is uh, when we go to the schools to install the solar and the institutional stoves, of course, it opens doors for us to speak to the students. First of all, because the, stu the, the, the principals are happy about the, the work that we've done because it's free of charge for all the schools that we've worked with. They don't really have to pay a thing. So they always feel happy about it. And any time that we want to talk to the students, we can easily call them and uh, they give us the, a, a time period to talk to the students. So those are the easiest ways I've got to keep the conversation going and educating people through the cleaning and reaching them in their local communities through going to schools and through using the installation project to also be a learning project for the students then plus social media yes there's always a way that, that just proves it uh, i want to move on to to discuss more of the, the coronavirus situation like we all know the world is going through extremely difficult times. And I know that Uganda is grappling yeah. with its own set of issues um, brought by, by the pandemic. And surely this has been 
the focus on the national level. So I was wondering, do you think that it will significantly, significantly delay climate action for the country, or in the country? Um, the issue of uh, the coronavirus, we understand it's a, it's a very serious situation. And we activists always say that you treat every crisis like the crisis it is. And um, this is a crisis that has put everyone, you know, on tension, put the world in tension. And uh, personally, I believe it has done that because it has not only affected um, the less privileged, it has gone on to affect even the privileged ones, the more privileged ones. So I believe that's the reason why countries have really agreed to come up, put lockdowns, because at the end of it all, uh, everyone is affected. But the issue of uh, coronavirus, sh it should not give us reason to dump the climate issue because climate change is a crisis of its own. Climate change has been here before coronavirus. Climate change is still here and it is still going to happen. I believe governments are going to use this opportunity to try and kick away uh, climate action, to try and push climate action because of the excuse of coronavirus. But I must say that climate change has been killing people for a very long time. The problem is that we've not been having recorded deaths We've not been having recorded victims. We've, been, we've not been having recorded destruction of farms or of houses because climate change has been affecting the people in the rural communities, the people who are, you know, affected the most, the people at the front lines. Those are the people who are less privileged. But I don't, I don't want the governments to wait for climate change to have to affect them in order for them to take action. Because the moment it, reach out, it reaches out to them, we'll be back to the same situation that we are seeing right now. The corona situation is teaching exactly what we are to expect if we continuously ignore that climate change is a crisis. This should be a wake up call for the government leaders that every crisis should be treated as a crisis. It shows that they're actually able they always have issues of, uh, we can't do this right now. We can't do this right now. It would take a lot of investment. But according to what we, we have seen in the corona situation, they're actually capable. All they need is to have the will to do it. So they shouldn't wait for the, the, the problem to escalate and become very worse and push us to what we are in right now. Because now we are in a lockdown, but it will be worse if climate change gets to this point. Because Corona is at a point where it's very dangerous right now, but climate change is heading to that point as well. If leaders don't take action right now, we will be in a very worse situation. Imagine if climate change hasn't yet reached its most dangerous point and yet it's already killing people, then what will happen when that time comes? We need to treat every crisis like the crisis that it is. So governments should not use this excuse to ignore that climate change is here, that climate change is killing people because they just don't record the deaths of climate change, but there are people who are suffering. And actually, even during the corona situation, the people who, have been, who are being affected by climate change are suffering the most because they're in lockdowns. Imagine they have their families or their farms or their crops have been affected already by climate change. But now they're in lockdown. They can't get any food. Some people are starving to death because they literally have nothing. So I think governments should not use this as an excuse. They should handle every crisis and treat it like the crisis that it is. Exactly, we couldn't, couldn't agree more. At now, that's what we're always saying, you know, climate crisis is a global crisis and uh, we need action now. We cannot afford to ignore it uh, because if we want to go back to, you know, a normal post-coronavirus that is sustainable, that we actually would be able to enjoy it, um, we need to address it now. Otherwise, it won't, it won't be um, possible. So, actually, yeah, tell me. Even after, even after the corona is done, we shall still be in a crisis. Life won't be normal. That is the problem here. Many people think that after corona, everything will be normal. We were in a crisis before corona. Right now, we are facing two of them. And even after corona, it will still be a crisis. 
So we need to address these issues. The same way that the governments have listened to the scientists and telling us to stay at home and stay in lockdown, they should do the exact thing when it comes to climate change. I have a question here on the chat that's very interesting, asking if uh, the Uganda government is taking about a comprehensive plan in order to contrast uh, climate change. Maybe there's something that you might have heard about. It would be interesting to know about that. Um, I have not heard of any comprehensive plan to try and tackle the issue of climate change. Actually, the plans I've seen have been about the corona. They have put so many plans, lockdowns, and you know all that, but I haven't seen any specific plan for climate change. One thing you should know is that every country has a, a specific um, ministry or cabinet for for the environment. You know, so um, they have they have they budget for the activities of those you know different sectors of the government so it is the those usual things that the governments do to try and show that yeah we are doing something for the environment we've planted trees here we've planted trees there but the concrete uh plan like uh moving away from the fossil fuel industry is not something that i've heard of uh or that i've seen anywhere and also you mentioned, you know, the, the problem of food security. Um, myself, I'm originally from Ivory Coast and it's something that I think on the African continent is widespread. Um, Ivory Coast is the top cocoa producer, but the country has lost uh, half of its uh, primary forest in the past 50 years. And we also had like a lot of floods and, and, and storms and floodings, you know, and it has been, it has made um, farmers vulnerable. So what, what do you think is the role of farming and agriculture in the climate crisis? And why do you see it as urgent um, point to, uh, to address? Yes, um, first of all, as I said, the issue of climate change greatly affects availability of food. And where do we get this food? This food comes from farming, so that means if the crops are affected by intense droughts or if farms are swept down by landslides or by uh, flooding, people are going to be left with nothing to eat. So farming plays a very important role when it comes to the climate issue. You know, we always talk about um, resilience. But have we ever thought of resilience in terms of food for people in case of these disasters? What happens when these people lose their only hope of survival? Some of these families, by the way, I have noticed most of the families in rural uh, communities, they have uh, very many children. It's usually a very large family. So imagine a large family depending on the farm and the farm is swept away by climate change and the, the impacts of climate change. It's so hurting because these people have to starve to death. So climate change is causing a very uh, big threat to food availability. That is why farming needs to be addressed. It needs, this issue needs to be put into conversation because at the end of the day, most of the people who are dying as a result of climate change in these rural communities that we never find out about, they die because of hunger. They are left with nothing to eat. Recently, I read an article that was talking about children brides, you know, and it was trying to explain families whose lives depend on subsistence farming. When they lose everything because of climate change, since they have very many children, they end up giving out. They gouge out for marriage so that they can remain with lesser children to take care of as their other child is being taken, taken care of by their newly found husband. And these children are young, they're teenagers. So you think about all those things and you realize that it's, it just starts from one thing, food, that a child loses access to education, first of all, because the parents can't afford to take them to school anymore, that a child is given out into marriage and they cannot enjoy their childhood anymore because they're now married to a very old man and it's because they, they're trying to survive and 
Of course, they never like this, but they're trying to survive, you know? So the issue of farming is a very, very serious issue when it comes to climate change, in the climate change conversation. We need to try as much as possible to make it very uh, resilient so that even in the case of these disasters, people still have something to eat when the disasters strike. Yeah. And you explain your personal journey of, uh, in being more aware of, you know, the fact that climate uh, change and climate issue was affecting actually your, your environment and your community. Um, do you think that there's this lack of formal climate change uh, curriculum from the government, which is maybe introduced at too much at a, a later stage in the education um, journey of, of, of students? Uh, do you think that this is one of the biggest challenge? when it comes to making uh, people aware of the urgency and the seriousness of climate change? Yeah, um, I really I agree with you. It's a, it's a very big challenge. As I told you, I've been in school and I got to find out about climate change after doing my own personal research and reading about it. Actually, when you when you're to go to schools and you ask the students what climate change is, they'll give you the theoretical uh, definition that is given to them uh, by the teachers. Maybe the average uh, change of temperatures over a long period of time. If you were to sample like ten students, they would give you the, the same answer, but they really don't know what climate change means. They really don't understand how bad it is and how it's threatening their lives. So this is a very big challenge. There is no climate education when it comes to the masses. The people who get to uh, learn about climate change are those who uh, do maybe courses in uh, environmental studies or uh, climate adaptation. I didn't even know about the existence of those studies till now. Yeah, that's a very good point. And you think we need to bring more of, I don't know, the social, the, the social aspect of the crisis to, to, to help make this uh, awareness stronger? Is it a matter of that people know factually, you know, but not how, they're not necessarily making the links on, uh, of how it's affecting their daily lives? Yeah, um, I think we, we need to take this awareness everywhere. A lot of awareness is going on, on social media, of course. But remember, not everyone has access to social media. Not everyone has a phone, especially in the communities where people are affected the most. So it is important to actually go to those communities, talk to those people. People are always ready to listen, you know. As I told you, the, 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 the thing that we use, uh, we go and clean their surrounding and they are happy about it. And we can easily gather them and talk to them because they are happy and they, are re they really appreciate like what we've done. So we really need to go to these people in person. It's not like all of them have access to television that they can see what is happening and try to, maybe those who are somehow educated can have the, and those who have taken into, you know, taken their time to understand more the issue of climate change. Because most of the people that I've seen who have been uh, doing climate-related uh, work in my country, when you get to know more about them, they actually studied environmental studies. But not everyone studies environmental studies. What about those who don't study? What about those who actually uh, don't go to school at all? So it is important to reach to the people in the local communities by ourselves, to reach those we can through social media, and to reach the young, the young children in schools, because these children are literally the, they are the future. So if they understand how precious the planet is to them, they will definitely do everything to try and secure it. One thing I know is that if you teach a child at a very young age something, they grow up with it because they're so innocent. They believe what you tell them. But if you do it at a much older, day, older age, like... Um, the young people right now that we try to talk to some of them they have more problems to deal with someone will tell you i don't have a job so don't tell me about climate change i'm hustling to get what to eat so don't tell me about climate change you know things like that so we need to reach people in all ways that we can those we can through social media and i believe actually most of the people on social media are the 
educated ones, you know. So we reach those on social media, we reach the local communities, and we reach out to the students in the schools. Yeah, I agree. It's important to reach out to outside of social media, outside of, um, you know, the, the already the bubbles that the youth movements have, have created, which are doing great job. But there's also people out there that might be, might feel empowered to do so if, uh, if we were to reach out to them as well. And that's an interesting question. Another one in the chat from Brilliant. Uh, who's asking, have you thought about harnessing indigenous knowledge system, especially in Africa, where people and cultures use various ways to relate and preserve the environment? I like that question because we see how indigenous people are preserving like most of our diversity. They live in harmony with you know, nature and we, we cannot tackle the climate crisis without making or giving space to their voices. So I'm wondering what you're talking, uh, what you're thinking about that. Yes, uh, my answer is yes because um, when I found out, you know, I I tried to understand. Um, my siblings, all our names, they have an they have a relation to nature. So what I'm doing of late, any interview that I have, I always integrate indigenous knowledge and how it's important to listen to indigenous knowledge and. Uh, Maybe if I have a speech at a conference, I try to bring in the issue of indigenous knowledge because I believe that the indigenous people have been able to preserve nature for quite a long time, over a hundred years. So we need their knowledge in order to integrate it with our solutions. We cannot just erase what they have been doing because it has been able to preserve um, the environment for quite a long time. Personally, I already told you what my name means. That is my my last name. Um, my siblings also, I come from a tribe, it's called the Buganda tribe, and uh, I'm a Muganda by tribe. So in our tribe, what they do, they give totems to everyone. So when they give you a totem, you cannot do anything to that totem. You can't eat it, you can't hurt it, because that's how we were raised, to respect our totems. And those totems are usually either animals or plants or trees or fish anything connected to nature so we are raised in that kind of way and i believe that that way we've been able to preserve um, millions of animals and plants and trees the same thing with the fish and also when it comes to um the names people are named after animals people are named after plants people are named after trees and fish among others so I believe that it is important to bring in the indigenous knowledge because it is precious. It has been able to preserve these things for quite a long time. And it's important to, for every activist to try and respect it and bring it in. Actually, we need indigenous people, we need indigenous knowledge in the center of the climate conversation because they have been able to protect these ecosystems even before some of us decided to become activists. They were already activists the moment that they were born. So we need them at the center of every climate conversation because I believe they have much to say and a lot to teach us. Yes, exactly, I couldn't agree more. Um, I have a big question for you. Uh, what, what do you think the solution are in Uganda, Africa, and for the rest of you know, the world when it comes to the climate crisis? What do you think also about the role of, for example, uh, intergovernmental institutions like the UN in dealing with the climate crisis? Because at now we are launching, uh, we launch a petition actually demanding, like I mentioned at the beginning of the call, uh, demanding that the Security Council declares um, a global climate emergency. So we know that it has the power to decide on measures to counter climate change. But what do you think about this, um, the, the power and the, the type of um, reach that those intergovernmental institutions can have in dealing with this crisis? and in finding solutions, both for Africa, but in general as well. Um, yeah, thank you for that question. Um, these are, uh, these intergovernmental, you call them intergovernmental, right? Sorry, uh, no, but okay. I didn't catch that. You call them intergovernmental, right? Yeah, exactly. 
Yeah. Yes. Um, I believe they have so much power and they're able to influence these, um, you know, these countries and the government leaders. Sometimes I feel like they are also not doing enough. I feel like they have um, all the ability to make these people to declare climate emergency in the various uh, countries of the world. We need solutions that will help us secure a better future. And the first step to that is accepting that we are facing a climate emergency right now. If I come to your house and I find it burning, and I told you, your house is on fire. If you don't believe me, that means you're going to get burnt. But if you believe me, you have the opportunity to let me get you out or for you yourself to try and get out. So this is what the, the leaders, every leader needs to understand, especially those who have more authority, those who have more power, those who seem to be the ones, you know, who make the decisions everywhere. We need transition, first of all. We need to transition from the fossil fuel industry. We understand that it is the lead emitter of carbons in the atmosphere and we cannot continue with it. I understand there are profits and all that, but these profits are just for a small population, for the privileged ones. They're the ones who enjoy these profits. And I must tell them right now that these profits are temporary. They are short term. That, that's why we need investments in things that are going to secure our future and the future of the coming generations. We need, they need to stop this greed and put people over the profits. I believe that there was a time the fossil fuel industry didn't exist, but people survived, right? I'm sure they did. So why are they so afraid to take the uncomfortable situ like decision to move away from it? They make it look like after fossil fuel industry, um, oh my God, we won't be able to survive. Kids, shut up, uh, go and do your homework. But I really don't believe that. I think that they are able, as we talked about the corona issue, they only came in because it affects everyone, including them. But the climate issue has not yet attacked anyone, you know? They have not yet felt that impact. But the moment one of them does, trust me, you will see that they are able to transition and stop investment in the fossil fuel industry. We need new paths to development, sustainable development. We need to transition to renewable energy. We need more sustainable cities. That is possible. We need to build more sustainable cities with urban forests, renewable energy in schools, in our families, in households. If they feel like that is not um, possible for them and it's too much investment, they should know that there is an activist in Uganda who is trying to supply these things to schools free of charge and trying to you know, collect the money and having very... Um, helpful people helping her out to push this the renewable energy in school so it's all about the will the moment you will you're able to so we need these solutions we need a transition from fossil fuel industry to more sustainable paths we need renewable energy investments we need green building we need urban forests we need our environment back the life of an activist stops being normal the moment they start demanding for action. We need to go back to the normal life. We need to secure people's lives and their future. Yeah. No, exactly. You said everything. Uh, I have a question from Jacopo. Uh, what do you think about, just circling back to the COVID uh, situation we find ourselves in, what do you think of the potential negative uh, effect of COVID-19 on the climate in the shape of a recession, uh, which could lead especially for developing countries to abandoning renewable energy plants that you were mentioning just a minute ago. Uh, pardon? 
So the question is about how, what do you think about the negative effect of that COVID-19 could have um, on the climate in the form of a recession, which could lead to having certain developing countries, you know, like abandoning all the climate uh, measures that they were, you know, relying on or uh, moving towards a cleaner, uh, more sustainable, um, yeah, pathway. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, I really get what you're saying. You know, sometimes I'll begin like this. Sometimes, uh, actually, most times, people or governments think that um, these are the renewable energy or the paths to development are not profitable enough. And we definitely know what the COVID uh, 19 situation is going to cause. There is going to be a recession in different, co in different um, economies of different governments. So we are worried that governments are going to give up on some of the measures that they had decided to take and look for more profitable measures to try and build their economies back. This is not just in developing countries, but also in developed countries. I feel like the developed countries are going to try as much as possible to get back on the top, but at the expense of the planet and of the people who are affected the most. I've been hearing out how they're going to bail our oil and gas companies after all this. Can you even imagine something like that? Literally, they are going to make more investments in uh, decisions that are going to make the planet and put it in a worse situation. So the potential um, challenges that COVID-19 is going to bring about to the climate is that governments and their leaders are going to try so much to make quick profit, to try and get their economies back to the top. And by this, they're going to put it at the expense and the cost of the people at the front lines of the climate crisis, because they're going to expect more emissions from these people. Those who are going to bail out gas and oil companies because they want quick production. So we expect more emissions from them. And this greatly threatens the climate movement and the climate activism and people's lives. And the other thing is that we are at a time whereby getting the climate message is very hard, you know, getting it out. At this point, people just want to listen to COVID-19 updates. So it is still a challenge for our activism as well. It shows how much the COVID-19 situation is already putting a challenge on climate issues. Because even getting the message out, showing your activism and trying to push leaders, leaders right now, their ears are closed when it comes to climate change. There are sometimes you post, for example, me, my Twitter, I usually post videos and uh, photos with placards and then some people come in my inbox saying why don't you talk about COVID-19 why are you ignoring COVID-19 this is the time for COVID uh, climate change is not that serious so it's already showing how much COVID-19 is doing that it is blocking the voice of activism when it comes to the climate movement but then even after it is gone it is going to affect the community in a way that governments will try as much as possible to get back to the top, to build their economies at all cost, so they can get quick profit, and not just quick profit, a lot of profit. So this is going to put the planet in danger, and this really worries me. Yeah, no, that's true. It's true to your point that uh, COVID-19 and this completely just justified is taking a lot of, uh, of, of our attention and space. But I'd say that maybe one of the only positive elements uh, from that situation in, in regards to the climate is that we're seeing that is bringing the world, especially due to social isolation, uh, is bringing the world, the, the world uh, global pollution to a low. And so I'm wondering how do you think we can bring those lesson learned from uh, pollution reduction into the post-COVID-19 era? Um, first of all, um, personally, I don't, uh, I don't rejoice in the fact that the COVID-19 has reduced on the pollution because of the many people that are dying. 
I can't really rejoice when in a when we are in a crisis like this and people are dying. So it is not something that I can personally be happy about. And uh, the issue of uh, pollution, as I explained in the previous question, we don't really expect. It's more like the pollutions are going to triple after COVID-19. As I said, governments are going to try as much as possible to make the factories run, to make the industries run, you know, to make the uh, the flight companies, the aeroplane companies run, they're going to try as much as possible to get uh, profit to try and build their communities. So <laughs> governments, I don't know if they can learn from something like this. I don't even know if they're thinking about climate change, but there are so many lessons that they can learn when it comes to COVID-19. First of all, it has taught us to listen to the science. Because when they listen to science, they're, li they're seeing results. When you stay at home, the virus doesn't spread. It only spreads when you're out. So leaders need to take this as well. And know that scientists, they're always telling the truth because they have done their research, they have seen everything. So they need to take the lessons from COVID-19 and listen to the science of climate change and understand that if we don't address the issue of climate change, we will even have worse impacts than we are seeing right now. I've seen photos on, uh, on Twitter and showing how beautiful the world is right now, how the lakes are clean, how the oceans are clean. And I believe we all love something like that. We love a clear sky and clean air. So I think governments should really learn that we need to have more sustainable paths in order to actually prepare for such disasters. Because now amidst such a disaster, there are people who are struggling to get something to eat, people who are struggling to get water to wash their hands, people struggling to get water to drink. But if governments had planned for such things, the thing is if you have a sustainable community, you can be able to curb any disaster that comes up, in that even if people are in lockdown, they can still survive. Exactly, couldn't agree more. Uh, it's, so I would sum, sum up by saying that it has taught us to listen to the science and that, you know, clear sky, water that is drinkable everywhere should always be what we're striving for, right? And that means, yes. that's exactly what it means, you know, um, hugely what it means to 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 have social uh, sustainable societies so i completely agree with that um so the webinar is slowly coming to an end uh, i try to address all the questions in the chat but i want there's something i really wanted to address with you uh it has to do with uh representation and you are doing a great job as i said multiple times in this conversation already um of amplifying the voice of you know african uh, climate activists and I just wanted to know your thoughts on how can we build not only a new standard that is about uh, sustainable sustainability, you know, that society are sustainable, it becomes the new norm, but also how do we how do we make it so we ensure that climate activists from continents such as Africa, you know, that are not not only Western voices, are not left out of those main uh, actions and discussion and basically how can we all globally and collectively work to ensure that those voices don't go from the margin to the center of the the, the page of this fight yeah um thank you um the first thing is to put an end to white saviorism that is the biggest challenge when it comes to the climate movement and the representation therein. Because it has always made it made look like it has always been made to look like the black race has nothing to contribute to save the world. That is what I've always seen. Even in movies, I've seen that. The black race is always the villain. I've seen that many times. So we need to put an end to that. There are communities in the African continent that have been demanding for action for a very long time, for years. 
for the decades, you know? There are communities that have been doing that. There are people who have been doing that. Recently, I was talking to an activist from Zimbabwe and I was so surprised to find out how much she had done and that she'd been in activism for over five years. But then we even knew about the work that she's doing. It was really sad for me to know that. So we need to ensure full representation of everyone. A person from maybe um, Germany cannot fully explain the impacts of the climate crisis, maybe in Kenya or in Zimbabwe. Is these people who see these things firsthand so they are able to address these issues and talk about how people issue of miss or under representation. I have been to climate conferences and still there is always an issue of imbalance when it comes to the activists. There are fewer activists of color and it is very disturbing. So this is something that we need to work on. I personally believe that every country has an activist who is fighting for a better future for everyone. And every activist has a voice that needs to be listened to. I believe that every voice has a story to tell. I believe that every story has a solution to give. And every solution has a life to change. That is why it is important to have full representation from different parts of the world. Climate justice cannot be justice if it is not global enough. It can't be justice if you're only fighting for our nationals or the people in our countries. It can only be real, it can only be justice, it can only be fair enough, it can only be good if every issue is addressed if every activist is given platform, because we all matter and we all have solutions to give. And we all want to save our future, not just a specific group of people. It's just that the African continent has quite a number of issues of its own. Not everyone lives in comfort. But there are, there are few voices, but even those few voices, there is power in them, there is power in listening to them because they are coming out, they are speaking up, they are telling what's happening in their communities. They need to be heard because they're looking for change, they're looking for action, they're looking to save their people, they're looking to save their future. That is why it is important to have full representation of activism in the media, on the world stage, because every voice matters and every solution is welcome to the stage. It is. I think that's how best I can talk about that. And you did it beautifully. It's such powerful uh, words. I'm seeing everyone in the chat <laughs> saying that if they could, uh, they would clap. <laughs> so I'm doing it for them. It's, it's so empowering. Thanks for those words, uh, Vanessa. And it's been wonderful discussing with you. Um, I think everything you said made so much sense. It's exactly what I'm now we're trying to push for uh, regarding climate the climate aspect, but also the representation um, aspect of, of the fight. Um, so it's amazing to see that everyone else is uh, enjoying it. Uh, I hope, Vanessa, that you had a good time. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> and please uh, do not, do not, um, yeah, we did also a poll, and uh, the poll, did, like, in, in the result, we see that uh, most people said, almost all people said that they, they, uh, they left the, they, 
feel in, empowered by the inspired and empowered by, by this uh, by this call. Um, so guys, do not hesitate to continue the conversation online on social media. You can follow Vanessa via the link that Laura would just send now in the chat. And if you are new to now, uh, you can also follow us in the links that Laura will also send in the chat. And yes, uh, finally, thanks to, for Laura uh, and Andrea for helping me behind the scenes and uh, Colomb for the live tweeting. Um, again, Vanessa, it was our pleasure. Thanks a lot. Uh, and Keep up the, the great, amazing work. <laughs>